Wednesday, July 7th, 2010 The Debtors and the Savers Ever hear the one about the little old lady living in an old but paid-off house with a shoebox full of gold coins in the basement? Across the street lived a big guy in a big McMansion. It had a special garage for the RV and another four-car garage for the other four cars. He had a boat at the side and a trailer with two jet skis in front of the boat. Then one day, little old lady noticed the big guy was gone. The bank had taken back his house. Most people thought big guy was rich and little old lady was poor. How wrong most people were. Tiger's Tale. I watched a pretty forgettable movie the other night on TV. It was just so-so from a filmmaker's perspective, but it had at least one redeeming quality from my blog maker's perspective. It highlighted a point I had been thinking about. The film is called The Tiger's Tale, and the basic backstory is identical twin brothers that were separated at birth when one was given up for adoption. The adopted brother is destitute when he discovers he has a twin who is a very public multimillionaire businessman. So, filled with envy and anger over being given up as an infant, he hatches a plan to steal his brother's identity and life for just long enough to liquidate his assets and make off with the cash. He is successful supplanting himself into his brother's life, only to find that the vast wealth is built completely on debt. What filled him with envy on the surface is nothing but a giant, net negative hole once he looks behind the curtain. Here is an eight minute version of the movie that contains all the relevant scenes. We pick it up right at the point where the adopted twin first arrives at his brother's office, pretending to be him, ready to liquidate a few assets. Bingo. What have we got in hand? What's the bottom line? The cash situation? Well, at least you're asking instead of avoiding the issue. We're going to need a legal opinion in here. We should send for Larry. <clears throat> the land for the stadium has really stretched us. We only have five in it. The bank has 40. No problem if we can win an appeal. But as it stands, the bank won't lend us another cent. If I wasn't such a nice person, I'd be telling you I told you so. You did, Sally. You did. She did. Get on with it. Yeah. We have a big loan on the Rings End office block. Oh, only 35% occupancy, we're not even covering the interest. So how much do we have in hand cash if we had to scrape it together from all sources? How much would it come to? Liam, all we have is overdrafts and loans. Unless you can sweet talk the bank into rescheduling our debt. We can't pay the wages next month. Cars. What about cars? Cows? Cars! They're all leased. You know that. More tax efficient. Him. Go for the appeal, laddie. <laughs> well, before I commit to what will be a time-consuming brief, I owe it to my partners to ensure our fees are secured. And it seems that you... All I'm saying, Jim, and this is not a threat, believe me, all I'm saying is, if you drive us to the wall, if we go under, you go down with us. I don't think so. If you want my advice, listen to Bertie's proposal. Drop your scheme and hit your right with him. It's the only way I can see to rescheduling your loans. Okay. Gotcha. We'll sort it out. Can I get a couple of grand cash on the way out just to tide me over? Jesus. 
Got it. <laughs> that must be worth a bit. Can't really say. I'll send you a written offer. Look, how much for the lot? Ballpark figure. That's something I'd have to discuss with my partners. And how about a cash deposit? <laughs> I really can't do that. Perhaps you'd prefer to do business with somebody else. You're selling up, Dad? Yeah, we're downsizing. Does Mum know? She's more of an upsizer. These should fetch a bit. I took up golf because you said you'd play with me. And you never did. Just like saying the boat. You promised to teach me to sail, but no. No time. The boat. I'd forgotten about the boat. You're supposed to be my father. Are you married? Divorced. No kids. Oh. She got the house. I took the drink. Lost my job. Living on the street. End of story. How did you find us? what he has. Well, I didn't, did I? I'll make you a cup of tea, then we go to the bank and get you the money. Drink up and then we go to the bank. I don't want your money. What are you going to do? Disappear. No. Don't go. Please. You, your brother... It's okay. You win. You can have your life back. Oh, no. You took it. You keep it. And all that goes with it. Damn it. All I wanted was to punish you, grab some cash and get out. Punish me? Why? For being you instead of me. No, you are me. All those debts. I fixed all that. There's no way a bum like me could run a business like that. You don't have to. Sally runs it. You go into any office in this town, there's an underpaid Sally who holds it together. We should let her in on it. Give her a pay rise. What about you? Send me a few bob now and again. When you have it. My apologies to John Gorman. I'm really looking forward to your remakes of The Wizard of Oz and Excalibur. And I loved Deliverance and Exorcist II, The Heretic. Mark's headed backwards. 
Karl Marx predicted the breakdown of capitalism as a result of class struggle, followed by the establishment of a grand commune in which all the means of production would become publicly owned and used only for the public good. Sounds pretty nice, huh? Imagine no possessions, I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. And all that peace and harmony stuff. Today we have many fine, intelligent, and exacting analysts all looking at the same economic data and coming up with vastly different analyses of the present global financial crisis. What sets them all apart from each other is not intelligence, or math skills, or even popularity. What sets them apart is the foundational premises on which they operate. And a false premise can skew a brilliant analysis 180 degrees in the wrong direction. Few analysts fully disclose their premises, but Karl Marx did, and in this we can find the one key flaw that sent his analysis off in a disastrous direction. Marx writes, The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. He got this part right. What he got wrong was his delineation of the classes. Marx's classes were 1. Labor, the proletariat or workers. Anyone who earns their livelihood by selling their labor and being paid a wage for their labor time. They have little choice but to work for capital, since they typically have no independent way to survive. 2. Capital, the bourgeoisie or capitalists. Anyone who gets their income not from labor, as much as from the surplus value they appropriate from the workers who create wealth. The income of the capitalists, therefore, is based on their exploitation of the workers. Simply put, Marx says it's the rich versus the poor. According to Marx, the rich exploit the poor to get themselves a labor-free income, which spawns a class struggle. This is an attractive perspective because it requires only a cursory, superficial judgment to place someone into one of the two camps, the rich or the poor. If someone is driving a Bentley, we immediately know which group they are in, right? But within this simple, foundational premise lies an error so serious that within 130 years of Marx's death, it caused somewhere between 85 million and 150 million deaths, depending on how you count them. That's an oddly large number of dead people for a commune in which class struggle has been eliminated, isn't it? Peace and harmony, my arse. As I said, Marx got one thing right. History does bear out the dramatic story of centuries of class struggle. But if we eliminate his one small, flawed premise, we can see it all much more clearly. The two classes are not the labor and the capital the rich and the poor, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, or the workers and the elite. The two classes are the debtors and the savers, the easy money camp and the hard money camp. History reveals the story of these two groups over and over and over again. Always one is in power, and always the other one desires the power. Number one, debtors. The easy money camp likes to spend and redistribute money it did not earn, either by borrowing it, taxing the savers for it, or printing it. They like easy money because it is always and everywhere constantly inflating, easing the repayment of their debts. Number two, savers. The hard money camp likes to live within their means and save any excess for the future. They prefer hard money, or in some cases, harder money, because it protects their savings and forces the debtors to work off their debts. 1789, the French Revolution. The hard money camp had been in power since 1720 when John Law's easy money collapsed. And starting in 1789, the easy money camp killed the hard money camp and took back the power. This is the way the easy money camp, the debtors, usually take power, by revolting against the hard repayment of their spending habits. Only nine years later, 1797, easy money collapsed once again as it had just done in 1720, and a new French monetary system based upon gold was again reinstated. 
This is the way the hard money camp, the savers, almost always regain control when the easy money collapses. On very rare occasions, and only under highly favorable circumstances, like moving to a new continent, the hard money crowd takes control by physically separating from easy money and declaring independence from the debtors. The American Revolution, yes, the Constitution mandates hard money. So, just to repeat for clarity, hard money regimes almost always end in bloodshed when the easy money camp slaughters the hard money camp to avoid hard repayment terms. And easy money regimes almost always end in financial suffering when the easy money collapses. Here are a few more examples of easy money collapses. Angola, 1991 through 1999. Argentina, 1975 through 1991 and 2001. Austria, 1921 through 1922. Belarus, 1994 through 2002. Bolivia, 1984 through 1986. Brazil, 1986 through 1994. Bosnia, 1993. Bulgaria, 1991 through 1997. Chile, 1971 through 1973. China, 1939 through 1950. Free City of Danzig, 1923. Ecuador, 2000. England, 1560. Greece, 1944 through 1953. Georgia, 1995. Germany, 1923 through 1924 and 1945 through 1948. Hungary, 1922 through 1927 and 1994 through 1946. Israel, 1979 through 1985. Japan, 1944 through 1948. Krajina, 1993. Madagascar, 2004. Mexico, 1993. Mongolian Empire, 13th and 14th century AD. Nicaragua, 1987 through 1990. Persian Empire, 1294. Peru, 1984 through 1990. Poland, 1922 through 1924 and 1990 through 1993. Romania, 2000 through 2005. Ancient Rome, approximately 270 AD, Russia, 1921 through 1922 and 1992 through 1994, Taiwan, late 1940s, Turkey, 1990s, Ukraine, 1993 through 1995, the United States, 1812 through 1814 and 1861 through 1865, Vietnam, 1981 through 1988, YAP, late 1800s, Yugoslavia, 1989 through 1994, Zaire, 1989 through 1996, Zimbabwe, 1999 through present. You see, Marx had it almost completely backwards when he said the rich exploit the poor for free income. Once we shuffle and redeal the two camps correctly, we see that it is actually the easy money camp, the debtors, that always exploit the hard money camp, the savers. Taxing them, destroying their savings, destroying capital, borrowing money only to repay it on easier terms, and sometimes even killing them. So are the debtors the rich and the savers the poor? Of course not. Is this clear enough? What does all this have to do with free gold today? Well, with history, another, and FOA as our guides, we can see clearly what is coming. And with a correct view and a wide enough perspective, we can also see how some fine analysts operating under false premises are inducing the wrong conclusions. Today we are living at the end of the longest stretch of time in which the easy money camp has been in power, both politically and monetarily. For a century now, they have been easing our money more and more. 
And for those of you obsessed with the emerging new world order and one world currency, surprise, you've been living with it for 66 years now. This latest push for central control and massive deficit spending by the easy money camp is simply the blow-off phase, right before the long-awaited collapse. And when easy money collapses, the transition is always financially painful, but not necessarily bloody like the French Revolution, which was the end of the hard money camp. Now, what happens during all periods in history, whether the hard money camp is in charge or the easy money camp are running things, is a transfer of wealth. This is important because when the easy money guys are in power, the transfer of wealth happens slowly and gradually and wealth flows from the savers to the debtors. But when easy money collapses, and it always collapses, there is a very rapid transfer of wealth in the other direction, from the debtors back to the savers. And this is where you need to take some action today, because we have been living in an easy money regime for so long now, the delineation of the two camps is somewhat obscured. There are many, many people who consider themselves savers who are still sitting in the wrong camp and will be on the wrong side of the coming, extremely rapid transfer of wealth. Today you need to be proactive if you want to get on the receiving end of this blowback transfer of wealth. You need to actively choose which camp you are in. And to do that, you need to recognize the two camps or classes. Remember, this is a class struggle. So let's put a few modern groups and people into these two camps. I think it's fairly obvious that almost all modern socialistic governments and their politicians addicted to sovereign debt and deficit spending are in the debtor class. These are the easy money guys. And the bankers as a class are generally there too. As I said in a recent post, the banker makes his largest profits during times in history when the liberal easy money crowd is in power, both politically and monetarily. And he makes his most absurd profits when the debtor class allows its debt to go too far, to the very mathematical limit. But don't worry, this unstoppable avalanche will reduce banking and central banking to what it should be, a utility for the public good. And this is because easy money debt must flow through the banking class as it is passed between the savers and the debtors. But as individuals, not banks, but individual bankers, we could say that some of them are debtors while others are savers. For example, would you agree that the Rothschild family, as a family unit, is in the saver class, while their industry or profession, banking, as a whole falls in the debtor class? Or perhaps we could say that the banking institutions, as the hollow corporate shells that they are, are closely aligned with the debtor class. But on the other side of the coin, we can broadly say that most of the young hotshot bankers and investment bankers probably fall firmly in the debtor class. When you look at the lavish lifestyle of a lot of these young guys, you don't see the debt it is built upon. Just like our character, Liam O'Leary in The Tiger's Tale, you could watch a Rothschild and a Goldman VP pull up to an event in identical Bentleys, not seeing that one is leased while the other is owned outright. Are you catching my drift? You can tell who the easy money guys are because they will always argue that a currency devaluation is preferable to forced austerity. They will say, the euro got it wrong because it doesn't allow for Greece to devalue. And in saying this, they put themselves firmly in the debtor camp. They are saying that the Argentine slash Brazilian slash Soviet slash Zimbabwe workout is preferable to what is happening in Greece today. How about that Soviet easy money collapse in 1992? Who came out ahead? Most average people that thought they were savers lost everything. So did the Russian banks take over Russia? Or did a handful of oligarchs emerge as multi-billionaires through the process and buy up anything in sight for pennies on the dollars? In which camp do you think these oligarchs were in? The debtors or the savers? Curiously, one of them just bought the New Jersey Nets. As I said earlier, 
almost all modern governments are in camp with the debtors, and this includes the Russian government. So are the oligarchs in the opposing camp as their beloved comrades in the corrupt government? Here's an interesting article. Here's the real reason the Russian oligarchs are buying up professional sports teams by Henry Blodgett, Business Insider. Snip. We hear that some Russian oligarchs feel that if they become highly visible owners of beloved sports franchises, the Kremlin will be less likely to take them out. Yes, as in that kind of out. Remember Alexander Litvinenko, the ex-Russian spy who got poisoned in London? So here's the important thing in today's dangerous world. We must each understand the difference between choices and inevitabilities. What is coming at us is inevitable. It is unavoidable. How we personally prepare for it is a choice we each must actively make. The coming blowback, hyper rapid transfer of wealth is not something that necessarily requires moral judgments of good and evil. It is simply a fact of life today. Pick which side you want to be on in this particular transfer of wealth by selling your debt-financed paper savings and buying physical gold today, you are making the conscious choice to join the camp of the true savers. Many people that consider themselves savers are precariously positioned right now. These people need to take active measures to get on the receiving end of this transfer of wealth to survive. Many, many, many average citizens amazingly still have this option, yet they don't even realize it. They need to get up and move over into the same camp as the Rothschilds and the Russian oligarchs and prepare to own the future. It's not a matter of good versus evil at this point. It is a matter of survival. The easy money crowd has had a really, really long run in the sun this time. There's no need to feel bad for them. And all the last ditch central control efforts we see today are simply the culmination of that run. But their influential position is completely dependent on the power afforded by the easy money debt machine that is now crumbling. Their power generator is out of gas and it's not the kind of gas you can legislate or print. But don't take my word for it, and certainly don't take financial advice from me. For that matter, don't take financial advice from anyone. Think it through yourself, quietly. Use your own head. This is the only path to peace of mind. You and only you will lose your wealth if you take the wrong advice. And this time, it doesn't take an MBA and a JD to understand the choices. It is easy to watch the dollar losing its reserve privilege today. And it is also easy to see who will come out ahead when that happens. All else is noise. Choose your camp wisely. Sincerely, FOFOA. His music is as timeless and relevant today as it was a generation ago. He revolutionized our music and our culture. This man was John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. Sky.